Welcome everybody. Uh, hello and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Lorena Neal and I'm one of the librarians at the Evanston Public Library and I'm joined this evening by David Weaver, the Carbon Free Buildings Coordinator for Citizens Utility Board. Uh, Mr. Weaver is going to discuss ways that renters and homeowners can access energy efficiency and cost saving programs. Uh, to have your own copy of the Citizens Utility Board guide that is uh, summarizing the benefits discussed tonight, uh, you can visit uh, the link that Mr. Weaver has very helpfully shared in the chat. Uh, I can share it again here too, um, just so everyone can, can see that. And uh, we can also pick up a printed copy in the library. We have some available at both the reference desk, which is on the second floor of the main library. And there are also some copies that are available at the Robert Crown branch as well. Um, if you have any questions for Mr. Weaver during the program, you can uh, either put them in the chat or in the Q&A section that you will see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, I'm going to collect the questions as we go and Mr. Weaver will answer them either if he sees them and, he, and wants to address them at the moment of the presentation, he'll address them there. Otherwise, uh, I will collect them and he will answer them at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can always message me in the chat also if you have any technical difficulties, um, and I'll try and help you with those as best I can. But without further ado, I'd like to turn things over now to Mr. Weaver. Welcome. Hi. First off, thank you so much for inviting us to come out and uh, talk to you guys today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and just to set some ground rules, uh, if you do have a question, uh, don't hesitate to throw it in the comment box. I'd rather, uh, you know, address your question as we're covering that subject than, uh, you know, try to go back through the slides to help you figure it out at the end. Uh, and I will have my contact information at the end of the slide. So if there's anything I can't address tonight, please feel free to give me a call or email and uh, we'll work, we'll work it out. Without further ado, uh, just a little bit about Citizens Utility Board. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that represents all of you, everyone who pays a utility uh, company, whether it's for electricity, gas, water, uh, cable, et cetera. We represent you. That's the purpose of our nonprofit. Uh, we have this hotline right there. You can give us a call at any time. We have an entire uh, department that's focus is helping consumers. Um, if you have any questions or you have a complaint, please give us a call. Uh, so how do we represent you? Well, we represent you to the Illinois Commerce Commission. Uh, they're the court that oversees all of the utility companies every time they try to rate your uh, increase your rates, which I hate to say it, they're all trying to do right now at record numbers. Uh, so we'll fight them at the Illinois Commerce Commission. We'll also fight them in the state legislature and we'll fight them in the courts and we'll fight them on the streets. Although tonight we're doing it through a library, but from the comfort of our own homes. Uh, and so we have over 500 outreach events every year uh, where we educate consumers uh, and we, uh, you know, sometimes we do petitions or sometimes we gather complaints and sometimes we do utility bill clinics. So uh, what that is, is anyone uh, can bring in all their utility bills, all their electricity bills or gas bills, bring it to us. And we'll look through them with you one-on-one -on -one and try to identify um, you know, if you're being scammed or if there's anything that's awry and how you can fix that. Uh, we also do it virtually. Uh, and there's that uh, email address right there to set that up. Bottom lines is we're advocates for affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy policies in Illinois. This is how I picture us. We're the small little nonprofit biting at the heels of the big utility companies, even while they're bribing our politicians. Uh, but just because we're a small dog doesn't mean we can't take them down sometimes. And uh, we've had some, some extreme successes and, and uh, we'll talk about some of those today, uh, but we're really gonna focus on decarbonization. Uh, so what is building decarb? We're gonna talk a little bit about greenwashing, uh, alternative retail electric and gas suppliers as a, an example of what it is not. We're gonna talk about energy efficiency, electrification, peak demand control and renewable energy. So a lot to cover today. So once again, if I am going too fast, please don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out to me through the comment box and we'll stop and we'll drill in and focus on it. So bottom line, what is building decarbonization? Well, here in the Chicagoland area, sometimes up to 67% of our uh, carbon footprint as a society is coming from our buildings. Uh, Illinois is the, the third highest state that uses natural gas to burn uh, to heat our homes, uh, which is a fossil fuel. 
So how can we ensure that uh, the energy used to power, heat, and uh, cool our homes doesn't result in greenhouse gas emissions? Well, on one hand, it's uh, reducing or eliminating natural gas uh, for cooking, heating, hot water, drying our clothes, etc. And at the same time, as we're switching to electricity, it's making sure that that electricity is coming from cleaner sources. Over the last decade, all but one coal power plant in the state of Illinois have closed. Uh, so that's that's helping decarbonize our electricity. So as we electrify our homes, uh, that's having extra benefits for decarbonization. There's a lot of different elements that are part of home decarbonization, energy efficiency, beneficial electrification, renewable energy, and energy demand management. We're gonna cover all of those today. Other main elements though are embodied carbon. Uh, so let's say you're insulating your home to weatherize it and increase energy efficiency. Well, some methods of um, insulating your home are actually have extremely high carbon footprints to make that insulation. Uh, so that's just one thing that we could talk about if we have time at the end. Transportation is a huge part of it. And then zoning and ordinances, all of those play into home decarbonization. But for today, we're gonna focus on the top four. One of the things we have to talk about though is the price of natural gas. Because as uh, you might be the most environmentally conscious person in the world, but if you can't afford to electrify your home, whether it's the upfront cost of electrifying or it's because electric prices are so high, uh, you just won't be able to do it. So for us to have a sustainable uh, solution, uh, it's got to be affordable. Well, in the state of Illinois, natural gas prices are extremely high. Um, and they've gotten a lot higher over the last two years. They, they have gotten a little bit, uh, they've decreased in price over the last few months a little bit. But if you look out over the next 10 years, the prices are only going to increase. Of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has had huge impacts on the global uh, natural gas market. Um, there's been increased demand after the pandemic and extreme weather. Extreme weather, like for example, this past December, uh, when we had that big blizzard, 70% of the power plants that shut down uh, because of the, the cold weather were actually natural gas power plants. So the myth that natural gas is one of the most reliable uh, energy sources is, is just that, it's a, it's a myth, it's not true. Uh, so we need to, you know, when we're looking at how we're gonna power our homes in the future, natural gas can't be a part of it due to reliability, but really due to price. Another part of this is, is fracking. The reason why we've had such low natural gas prices over the last 10 years is because uh, fracking, uh, which is mining for natural gas in, a, in one particular way, uh, created a lot of really inexpensive natural gas. However, it has significant environmental impacts. And as there's more and more awareness of it, people who live near fracking mines are putting up more and more resistance. So regardless of what we want here in Chicago and Evanston, uh, it's more difficult to frack anywhere because the locals are fighting against the mines and it's becoming more expensive to mine for. Plus the easy access natural gas is, is being used and it's you know, only the remaining harder to get gas is what's available. So for all of these reasons, the prices of natural gas are going to go up over the next 10 years, as many analysts uh, assess. So what is not decarbonization? Alternative retail electric and gas suppliers, uh, typically they're very, uh, very much like scams and they use very uh, shady business practices. My own grandmother was scammed. Uh, in fact, I was just helping a, a man about three weeks ago. I looked at his electric his electricity bill, and here on the top right of the um, of the slide, you can see where it says supply X Y Z Illinois Power Supplier provides your energy. And on the right side, it says ComEd delivers your electricity. So ComEd is not allowed to make a profit off of. Uh, the supply. However, these alternative retail electric suppliers and gas suppliers are allowed to make a profit. So that's the first thing as an issue. But some of them will defend that profit, or they'll depend their higher. They'll defend their higher cost by saying, "Hey, what we're doing is we're actually going to be writing you um, a green plan. You're only going to be charged an extra nickel or an extra dime per kilowatt hour, uh, but we're going to be giving you green electricity." Uh, Unfortunately, there's almost no oversight into this. There's no transparency and there's no certifications to back them up. So some of the questions you got to ask is, how is this changing the traditional generation? And how is this increasing and where is it increasing renewable generation? And if they're telling you they're only going to be giving you uh, clean energy, well, that's, that's just not how the grid works. That's a, that's a misleading at best and outright lie at worst. 
because tra traditional generation, renewable generation, both feed into the grid. And then from the grid, you pull electricity into your home uh, or your business. Same thing with, you know, if they're doing renewable natural gas or some other kind of green gas, you can't separate it and say only, I only want to pull this from the grid. Whatever is in the grid is what you're pulling into your home or your business. Uh, sometimes they'll say, hey, we're purchasing renewable energy certificates as an offset. However, they're not telling you how much money they're putting into it. They're not telling you uh, the quality of those renewable energy credits or the age of them. The, they are allowed to sell and resell um, renewable energy credits. So potentially it's one that was bought 20 years ago, helped the wind farm. But then since then, it's been sold 10 times. And that that increased expense isn't isn't actually helping that wind farm that was created 20 years ago, potentially on a different grid. So there's there's no transparency. And the bottom line is, even if you're willing to pay more on your electricity to help generate renewable energy, there's better things you could be doing with your money um, where you can verify that it's actually helping and someone's not just laughing at your expense all the way to the bank. So what can you do now if, you, if you're not gonna do an alternative retail electric or gas supplier? Well, energy efficiency, peak demand control and renewable energy. So the first step has got to be energy efficiency. The cheapest and the cleanest energy is the energy you don't use. So if you insulate your home, and even if you're burning natural gas, you don't have to burn as much gas uh, to heat your home. Well, that's the cleanest and cheapest electricity or gas that, that you didn't have to, to, to use. Uh, furthermore, statistically, every dollar you spend on energy efficiency is going to bring you $3 back in energy costs. Uh, so it's a really great investment on your money. Uh, unfortunately, though, oftentimes in this world, you have to spend money to make money. And this is certainly one of those things. The first step to energy uh, efficiency is a home energy assessment or a home energy audit. Uh, we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Uh, bottom line is the home energy assessment is offered by ComEd or NICOR. Uh, they come to your home for free. They'll bring with them LED light bulbs. Uh, hot water insulation for your pipes, aerator for your, your shower heads and sinks. Uh, they'll bring a few other things with them. Most of that is free and they'll install it for free. Some of those things uh, they'll give you at a discounted price, uh, cheaper than you could get it at the local uh, hardware store. So that's all great. However, the home energy assessment, they walk around, they install those things and they give you advice. But a lot of times they have 20 jobs to get to in a day. So they're trying to get in and out and on to the next job. Plus, they're not bringing any equipment to test your home. So the home energy assessment is definitely the first step if you haven't done so already. The, the next, the real first step, though, is the home energy audit. Uh, someone's going to come to your home with a lot of equipment. They're going to actually test the building envelope. They're going to see where you're losing heat. Uh, where there's uh, you know drafts, where they're coming into, where they're going out of. Uh, they're going to bring IR cameras with them. And what they're going to do with all this data that they're collecting and walking you through is they're going to they're create an itemized list. And they're saying, hey, you lose most of your heat from this one window. Replacing this window will cost you about this much, and you should see this much about energy savings. And they'll do that step by step for everything that uh, that you could do to improve your home. They'll even give you recommendations. Hey, there's a little, little gap here, but it's not worth it to fix. Or, you know, but the nice thing is it's prioritized. So you can start creating a plan uh, year by year on how you're going to make these home energy improvements. Um, the nice thing is there's no better time than now to make home energy improvements due to the Inflation Reduction Act um, and all the incentives that are a part of it. The home energy assessment, uh, there's the uh, phone number. Uh, to call if you uh, if you want to set it up. You could also set it up on ComEd's or NICOR's uh, website. Uh, those are some of the things they'll bring with them. And then the home energy audit, the Department of Energy has a really great uh, website all about professional home energy assessments. The link's on the bottom of the slide. What that will do uh, is it'll give you information to prepare for your home energy assessment, what questions you should ask when they get there. Um, and they'll also have a list of certified auditors in your area that you can look at. Uh, just real fast, you know, I, there's a lot of disinformation or misinformation, sorry, about LED light bulbs, how they're not as bright uh, or they're orange or, you know, all kinds of misinformation like that. But if you take an old light bulb that has a brightness of 800 lumens, uh, lumens is how they measure how bright something is. And you take an energy star LED light bulb of the same brightness, 
you can see right there the uh, the LED light bulb over a year will save you about uh, you know just shy of five dollars per light bulb. And if you think about all the light bulbs in your home, those five dollars start to add up real fast. Another thing I'll, I'll bring your attention to, I think a lot of people aren't aware of, on the bottom left side of the the slide are uh, dryer balls. So most of these are made out of wool. They're about the size of a snowball. And uh, as my nephews and nieces can attest, they make perfect indoor snowballs. Uh, they hardly weigh anything. They're wool that has been sewn together and tightly into a small ball. And you put five or six of them in your dryer. And what it does is while you, while you dry, it creates space between your clothes to help your clothes dry faster and reduce uh, the amount of time the clothes need in the dryer, therefore saving you energy. Uh, and saving you money. They're often, you know, 10 to $20. You can get them at Target or Amazon or anywhere else you buy, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond, anything like that. Um, they're fantastic and they do make for really great indoor snowballs. Um, so moving on to the Inflation Reduction Act. This bill was uh, passed in August um, and then signed by the president. And then all of their measures were supposed to start in January. All of the tax credits do. And they last for the next 10 years. Um, all consumers, regardless of your income, can claim a, a tax credit up to 30% of a qualified project for up to $1,200 annually. That's where that home energy audit really comes in, is you could start mapping this out and looking at expenses and say, okay, I'm going to do all of these things this year and all these things the next year to make sure that you get that $1,200 tax credit each year. Um, so... Home energy audits typically cost somewhere between $350 to $600. In Evanston, they'll likely be more expensive due to the cost of labor, uh, but the federal government will give you up to $150 as a tax credit back for doing so. Uh, as long as that's, um, you know, if it does cost $500 and that $150 is 30% of it and, and you're, you're set. Uh, you can also get up to $500 to replace your doors, uh, exterior doors, uh, up to $250 per door for two doors total. $600 for replacing windows, uh, and then $600 for qualifying very efficient upgrades of your air conditioning, if you need to upgrade your electric panel, uh, or water heaters and water boilers. There's also a separate $2,000 tax credit. So in one year, you can get $3,200 of tax credits through this program uh, that up the $2,000 is for upgrading your space or water heater. Um, which is perfect because the, the biggest energy uses in your home is first space heating and then second water heating. Uh, so this is a really great, really great incentive. Talking about uh, beneficial electrification, uh, you can move from your gas furnace to a heat pump space heater. And there's a couple different types of those we'll get more in depth on later on in this presentation. Gas stoves to induction stoves. I also just added a few slides earlier today on it that we can talk about. Uh, gas water heaters to a heat pump water heater, and then gas clothes dryer to an electric clothes dryer. Those tend to be uh, the four things that you need to swap out in your home if you want to uh, cap your gas pipe and eliminate, um, you know, stop burning natural gas in your home and also save uh, sometimes up to $600 on no longer paying the fixed fees of uh, NICOR gas. So NICOR gas, uh, they charge you for the therms that you burn to heat your home. Uh, the gas that you use, but they also charge you to be a part of the system if you're a customer because they have to maintain all their pipes across the entire system. So what they do is they uh, crowdsource that cost. Whenever they need to replace uh, a pipe underground, they charge everyone for it. Uh, but if you are no longer a customer because you're no longer burning gas, you eliminate all those fixed costs. And that can be you know up to $600 a year. So that's pretty important. Why do we want to do this? Uh, Affordability, we already touched on that. Protecting the planet, major thing. And then one other uh, big part of this is your health, particularly with the gas stoves in your home. You're burning natural gas in your home without any filters. And even if you have a, um, uh, the, sorry, the vent, thank you, the, the vent above your stove, most vents in most homes don't actually take the, the fumes out of the home. It just moves it around, which isn't actually helping anything. Uh, the, there's been a lot of health studies lately showing that if, uh, if you have children in the home, they're 42% more likely to develop asthma or other respiratory illnesses if you have a gas stove in the home. And it's not just a problem when you're using the gas stove, it leaks some of these uh, 
toxic gases into your home, uh, even when it's not on. So it's a, it's a major health concern as well. So electrification. Uh, Cub research found that homeowners who switch from uh, 80% natural gas energy efficient uh, furnace to an air source heat pump can enjoy lifetime savings of up to 24 1700 to about $47,000. Uh, this was done in Chicago, so it's a real local example for us. Uh, looking at the chart on your right, uh, the bottom part of it shows uh, the temperature, minus 20 all the way to 60 degrees, um, and then how much it's going to cost heat at that temperature going up. So for example, uh, the, the green and blue line are different types of heat pumps, and they are more efficient when it's warmer outside, an air source heat pump works by moving heat. Uh, easy to think about is we already have this in our homes. Your refrigerator, you can't create cold. You can burn gas to create heat. You can burn wood to create heat. You can run electricity through a coil to create heat, but you can't create cold. So what your refrigerator does is it takes the heat energy within it and it moves it out. And that's why sometimes you can put your hands at the bottom of your fridge and you can feel warm air coming out. Some of that warm air is the heat that was inside your fridge. Your freezer just does it to a more extreme uh, level. The air source heat pump does the same exact thing, but in two directions. So when it's hot in your house and you want to cool it down in the summer, just like your fridge, it'll take the heat energy in your home and it'll push it outside. And conversely, in the winter, when you want to heat your home, it takes the heat energy outside and it brings it into your home. So a lot of people will say, wait a second, what about when it's 30 degrees outside? Um, and it's cold outside. How are you going to take heat outside and bring it indoors? Well, we're all local to Northern Illinois. We can get, we all know it gets much colder than 30 degrees. Uh, so there's still heat energy in the air. There's still heat energy in the air until you get to Kelvin, uh, which is something like 400, negative 453 degrees. Up until that point, there's still heat energy in the air that it can move around. Uh, of course, though, it's less efficient the colder it is. So this chart shows that typically about minus five degrees is when it becomes more cost efficient to heat your home via natural gas. Uh, maybe around negative 10 propane, but I don't think anyone in Everston is still using propane. Uh, but the thing is in Northern Illinois, there's a yearly average of eight mornings below zero, not even negative five. So the few heating hours where it's more cost effective to use natural gas uh, if you talk about the lifetime of the system from uh, the whole year, you're going to save money by switching to an air source heat pump. And then they also make dual fuel heat pumps, where it's a heat pump up until a certain degrees, uh, usually uh, somewhere between 30 degrees to minus 10 degrees, somewhere in that window where it'll actually, the furnace will kick in at a certain temperature. Uh, and then uh, that's, that's how some people, in fact, I was just helping a consumer whose furnace died in November. Uh, he needed an immediate solution, so he, he installed a dual fuel system. Talked to him last week. He said his energy bill, combined electric and gas over the entire winter, has been 50% less than it was last winter. Um, so big savings there. Uh, and that's just kind of one way to look at using an air source heat pump. Another type of heat pump is geothermal. It uses the heat energy in the ground rather than the heat energy outside. This is really great because in northern Illinois, it's about 52 degrees uh, year round underground, as long as you get a couple feet below the frost level. Uh, so it's way more efficient because it can take a lot more heat from the ground and bring it into your home. And then in the summer, replace that heat as a heat sink by putting that heat into the ground. The nice thing about the geothermal, even more than the air source uh, heat pump, is that it not only replaces the air conditioning and the furnace like your air source heat pump would do, it also replaces your water heater. And it's more efficient at all three of those uh, goals, heating your space, cooling your space, and heating your water, than all the individual systems that currently do it. Plus, you get to save money because instead of paying to maintain three different systems, you're only paying to maintain one system. Um, and then you have the energy savings of beating all three of those with energy efficiency. Uh, and then you're only maintaining one system. And then geothermal heat pumps last a lot longer. Uh, so just so focusing in on this chart, um, most most uh, most residents in Northern Illinois currently have an 80% efficient natural gas and a furnace with a 10 seer air conditioning unit. So that's the fifth uh, column in this chart. The gray is for lighting and other appliances. The red is for heating. 
the blue is for uh, cooling, and then the brown is for water heating. So um, if you compare that with the uh, efficient 16 sear standard heat pump, you can see that it saves you cooling expenses and it saves you heating expenses. But if you go all the way to the geothermal heat pump, you have the most savings in all of them. Uh, so of course, that is all fluctuates based on the cost of um, gas, which changes every month and the cost of electricity. Um, but this is kind of a, a calculation to show you what you can expect for a typical home in the US Midwest. Uh, talking about electrification, like I said, there's no better time. Uh, the IRA uh, offers these electrification rebates. There's up to 263.6 million to help low and moderate income Illinoisans transition away from natural gas over the next 10 years. The, uh, the nice thing is this is based on area median income. So you're being compared to everyone else who lives in Evanston rather than everyone who lives in say Cairo, Illinois, which has a much lower income. So it's based on your area median income. And the link at the bottom of this slide is where you can look it up. You just type in your, uh, your address, hit enter, and it'll tell you what 100% of the area median income is and what 80% of it is. Uh, I looked it up just prior to this presentation and it's about $105,000 is the area median income in Evanston. So 80% of that, um, somewhere in the 80,000s, I think it's like 85,000 roughly. Uh, if you make less than that, you can qualify for a full price of an electric appliance up to a $14,000 cap for the full level of the rebate. Uh, for everyone who makes 150% of that area median income, which is about 160 grand a year, uh, you can get 50% of the cost of appliance for the full level of the rebate up to $14,000. Um, so if you wanted to replace your electric stove with an induction stove, uh, and if you made less than 80%, you get that full $840. If you're within that 150%, you'd get $420. That's how that rebate system works. One key note on these rebates though, this is federal money that's gonna be administered by the state of Illinois. So it's not launched yet. The Department of Energy is currently asking for uh, feedback on how they should uh, set the requirements for the states to do this. And Cubs actually act, taking an active role in helping shape that. Then this spring, the Department of Energy says they expect to release their guidance to the states. So that guidance will be released to the Illinois EPA's Office of Energy, in which case they need to turn around. There might be requirements within the federal guidance to, to take public hearings on how they will um, administer the program within the, the bounds of the federal um, requirements. So it could be as early as the summer and as late as this winter. Um, so I'm guessing that it would be about this fall. Uh, that they will be able to launch this program, these rebates would be available. We can't promise that these rebates will be retroactive. However, if your stove breaks or your furnace breaks, um, I would definitely keep the receipt just in case it is retroactive. So $840 for replacing your stove, uh, oven, or clothes dryer, $1,600 for insulation, air sealing, and ventilation. So that's very important and goes back to that home energy audit. Uh, 1750 for the heat pump water heater. The thing is, a lot of these things require some electric wiring uh, changes. For example, if you want to change out your stove, behind most gas stoves is a 110 volt outlet, but most electric stoves uh, require a 220 volt uh, outlet. The federal government thought of that and they allocated up to two and a half grand for electric wiring. The more you electrify, the greater the chances are that you're going to have to upgrade your electric panel. Uh, which case they thought of that in advance as well. And they're providing up to $4,000 for this. Uh, and then there's that $8,000 rebate for air source heat pumps. So a lot of incentives here. So induction stoves, there's a lot of uh, brouhaha about these, a lot of um, controversy in the news. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on them. Electric resistant stoves are the old electric stoves that people don't like. Um, However, in some ways, they are much safer than natural gas. There's not, you're not burning natural gas in your homes. And uh, quick, quick story, when my mom was a kid, uh, they couldn't afford to go to a salon for her haircuts so or her mom cut her hair, but she didn't like how her mom cut her hair. So she refused to get a haircut. Next thing you know, her hair was huge. Uh, and then she went next to the gas stove and it caught fire. And 
it scarred her for life. So she, when I was a kid, we grew up with the old electric resistant stoves because she didn't want there to be any chance that any of her kids could catch fire. Um, those were the old stoves. Um, the new electric induction stoves work via magnets and they're way more efficient. Um, if you're boiling eight quarts of water, they boil it the fastest. Uh, so you don't need to run it as long. So it saves you time and it saves you money. Um, furthermore, a lot of the reasons why people didn't like electric resistant stoves is because once you get into boiling, uh, it's hot and it takes a long time to cool down. So for temperature control, for, for people who are really into cooking, the electric resistance just didn't have it. And the natural gas, when you when you move the dial, you, you can physically see less gas is coming out and that adjusts the temperature faster. However, once again, induction stoves are able to change temperature the fastest, uh, giving you the most control over your cooking process. And then, uh, energy efficiency. So when you're burning natural gas, some of that heat goes into your pan, but a lot of it actually goes out and heats your kitchen. Uh, so it's the least efficient when you're talking about how much is it going towards your food versus your kitchen and induction uh, stoves win here as well. One note on induction stoves is that they work via magnets. Uh, I don't want to get too much into the science of that, but that means that you can't use uh, aluminum or like gas, uh, sorry, glass uh, pots you need to use uh, you know, metal pots that aren't aluminum in order to, to cook your food. Um, the nice thing is, is it works via magnets. You can turn it on full heat and put your bare hand on the stove, you will not get burned. You won't feel any heat at all. Now, if you've been cooking on that stove you know, for, for an hour and then you move your hot pans off the stove, it will be hot. It just had a hot pan sitting on it. But a couple of minutes later, you can put your bare hand on it once again, no burn. So for especially families with kids running around, uh, it is much safer. Okay, uh, we talked a lot about geothermal heat pumps. I really like this photo on the side. It, it's, it really explains why the heat pumps last much longer. So uh, the, the pipes that go into the ground are usually guaranteed for 50 years, which is crazy to think about that someone's gonna install something in your home. And if anything goes wrong in the next 49, 364 days, they have to put money towards fixing it. Uh, but that's the way it is because uh, they're confident in their work. And in Illinois, we don't really have issues with earthquakes. So the ground is very stable and it's protected from all the elements. It's not going through the, the freeze uh, cycle like everything that is exposed to the elements is. And then the part of it that is in your, the heat pump itself is actually in your home. So once again, it's protected from the elements. Uh, so a lot of heat pumps last 25 years plus. I was just talking to a man in DeKalb a couple months ago Who's, uh, whose geothermal heat pump is on its 31st birthday and he hasn't replaced anything. Um, and it's still working as efficiently as the day he put it in. So it's a really great system. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of the, the cost for this. So on the right, you see my chart. The upfront cost is about $30,000. There's a ton of valuable, uh, variables associated with it, different models, um, different soil, different homes. So the estimated cost is about $30,000, but it could be $24,000, it could be $40,000, it just depends on the home. Using this, uh, the geothermal heat pumps have a 30% tax credit. So that would bring it down $9,000 right off the bat to the energy tax credit. And that's rollable over multiple years, which is fantastic. Then it also gets that $2,000 a space heating tax credit that we just talked about. Additionally, ComEd has a lot of incentives and they're required by law to offer energy efficiency programs. So they'll give up to $9,000 rebate as well for geothermal, but your typical home can expect that to be about $4,000 because it depends on the size of the system. So if you're, if you're doing the math with me, that's half off right there and you're only gonna be paying $15,000. And when you compare that, it, it replaces your furnace, replaces your air conditioning, and it replaces your water heater, uh, then it begins to make financial sense, especially when you consider the estimated yearly savings is almost $2,000 a year. Uh, so it is uh, the biggest barriers to geothermal is the upfront cost and having enough space to put it in. Uh, you do need, um, you know, either in your front yard, side yard, or backyard, the space to have uh, a vehicle that's slightly bigger than a than F one hundred and fifty pickup truck to get in there and put in the put in the pipes. 
However, of course, it's free to get a quote and to uh, to have them come out to your home and ask if your if your house is a viable option for geothermal. Um, so air source heat pumps are great uh, for people who live in condos. Uh, however, you know condominiums uh, and buildings can use geothermal. In fact, uh, the community college of Lake County, seventy percent of their buildings. Uh, are heated and cooled off of one geothermal system that goes into all of the various different buildings. It's called network geothermal, but there are certainly ways to do it uh, for condominiums and entire neighborhoods. Of course, that's difficult because you got to get everyone on board. Next thing we're going to talk about is energy demand. So we have to start thinking about when are you using electricity and when is society using electricity? So I actually asked one of my uh, coworkers to put this together. Um, she uses the most electricity uh, during these times. So she's sleeping, but around 5 a.m. or 5.30, her roommate wakes up um, and then gets out of the home and the electricity use drops back down because she's just sleeping, nothing else is on. Around 8 a.m., she wakes up, makes breakfast, gets ready for the day. And then throughout the day, it's slightly elevated because she's working from home. 1 to 3 p.m., she uh, made lunch, turned the fan on, and you can see that her electricity use jumped jumped there as well. Uh, and then she went back to work. And then around 5 p.m., she was done for the day, got ready because she had been cooped up in her home all day. She left. Um, electricity use was still lightly, slightly higher, though. Uh, maybe the air, air conditioning kicked in or her, her roommate was back. And then around 9-11, she came home, turned on the TV, turned on some lights. And uh, so you can start to see where she uses electricity during the day. This is important because there's programs where you can uh, switch from paying the average, most, uh, most users on ComEd. It doesn't matter if you use electricity during peak time or during off time, they just charge you the average cost of electricity for the entire day, but you can sign up for hourly pricing. Why this is important? Well, society, um, you know, at least here, we start to use a lot more electricity starting around noon, peaking around 5, 6 p.m. when everyone gets home from work, is cooking, maybe watching some TV, all the lights are on, uh, the air conditioning is kicked back on because people are home. And then as people start to go to bed, us as a society start to use less energy. This is important because to meet that increased demand, ComEd and all of our electricity suppliers have to turn on some extra, uh, what we call peaker plants, power plants that only turn on for the peak. And the reason why they only turn on during the peak is they're the most expensive to run. Um, so your average user, at least back in September, was paying 11 cents uh, per kilowatt hour, even if they were using electricity at midnight when it's cheapest and when they were using it at 5 p.m. because they were getting charged the average price. Peak time savings is a program where ComEd will let you know in advance via text or via email, however you decide, and they'll say, hey, we're going to be entering a high usage period soon. Any electricity that you normally use but don't use during this time frame will give you a credit. So, hey, we expect, you know, you're normally using, just for easy math, 10 kilowatt hours from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. But if you cut that in half, we'll give you that back in uh, credits. This program is fantastic because it's all carrot, no stick. You could just like to see society burn. And whenever they send you this alert, turn on every appliance that you have. They're not going to charge you anything extra. You'll just get charged to the average price for the uh, electricity. But if you are fortunate and able to adjust, you would actually um, save money. So it's all carrot, no stick, fantastic program. I think everyone should sign up for it. Hourly pricing is they're gonna charge you what they're paying for that hour. So from midnight to 6 a.m., any electricity that you use, they'd only charge you two cents a kilowatt hour. However, between the hours of 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., they might charge you 15 cents an hour. So this program is carrots and sticks. And it makes sense for people, um, if you have an electric vehicle, for example, and you could plug it in right before you go to bed, in which case, instead of getting charged that 11 cents, you're only getting charged two cents per kilowatt hour. Um, or if you don't work um, the society average uh, you know, shift, if you work the night shift um, and you're able to adjust your um, your electricity usage to not reflect the peak demand, this can be a really great program for you. If you are going to do this, 
uh, the nice thing is you can try it out for a month and say, oh, I lost 10 bucks. I'm not interested in doing this program. Uh, and you could switch over the very next uh, billing period. That being said, most people who do this in the short term, it may not work out so well, but when they average it out across an entire year, they're able to save money, but you need to do a, a lot of uh, soul searching and analysis to decide if this is the right program for you, because there are a lot of, there are sticks associated with this program. Um, this is just an example of one day. Um, over this day, they charged everyone 11 cents, but there's really only one hour that went above 11 cents and a couple hours that it came close. So this day would have worked out really well to be a part of the system, except for noon. So overall, it would have been great. However, on this day, on September 15th, you can see that there's some hours that almost went to 15 cents. Um, so depending if, if you do conform to what most society does, and that's when you use the most electricity, this would not have been a great day for you. You would have spent more money than uh, your average consumer who wasn't a part of the program. So AC cycling is a great program. Uh, all carrots, no sticks. Uh, what they do is they cycle your air conditioning uh, during the summer if there's a really uh, high electric use period. Um, they don't tell you in advance, but they also don't do it on weekends or holidays. And what they do is they just kind of turn off part of your air conditioning, but they keep the fan on. Uh, so your temperature in your home doesn't change more than a few degrees. And everyone I've talked to who's done this program, I said they never even noticed it, but it was a great way to save $40. And if you're a little bit hesitant, you can go with the 50% option instead of the 100% the option where they don't do it as much or as long. Uh, and of course, at any time, if it does kick in and you do notice it, uh, you can stop it right away and go back to, uh, you know, just eliminate the program for that hour. Maybe you have people over for some reason. Uh, so really great program I recommend everyone sign up for. Um, I think last summer they only did it twice and during the entire summer. So it's, it's pretty low risk. And of course, you can cancel it for free um, pretty easily. I just wanted to hit financial assistance real fast. Uh, even if it, it doesn't apply to you, uh, you might know someone this can help. LIHEAP, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, is a fantastic program for people who are struggling to pay groceries and keep the heat on. Uh, this can provide grants from the federal government to pay for, uh, for heating. Uh, there's also the Illinois Home Weatherization Assistance Program, um, same income eligible level of 200% of the federal poverty level, um, but that gives a household funds to actually improve their home energy improvements, which should show them you know, long-term savings every single month. NICOR also has a program, but it's even more strict uh, to get into it. So shifting to renewable energy, um, I hear a pervasive myth that, you know, oh, it's cloudy today, uh, so we can't, we're not, a, Illinois is not a good state for solar. Well, so Germany is a perfect counterexample. Germany has the most uh, solar uh, energy produced per capita out of anywhere in the world. Uh, you can see that they're mostly a purple and blue country. If you look at the bar graph or the bar on the on the bottom of the slide, the the red is indicative of where more sun is shining, and the purple is where least sun is shining. So pretty much the entire continental U.S., except maybe parts of of uh, Washington, um, get more sun than Germany. So we're absolutely a perfect place for solar generation, um, and we happen to be one of the best states in the entire union right now to install solar. There's three main um, uh, reasons why. The first one is the federal investment tax credit. So uh, similar to geothermal, right now the federal government will cover 30% of the total cost of installation of uh, solar panels. Uh, and they'll continue to do that for the next 10 years. And that's through a tax credit, which once again, you could roll over to multiple years. Um, Fantastic. But every state has that. So that doesn't give us an advantage. What gives us an advantage is the Clean and Equitable Jobs Act. Within that is the state solar renewable energy credits. This is the state of Illinois paying you to produce electricity through solar panels. Um, it typically covers about 30 to 40 percent of the total cost of installation. And uh, you get it month by month, usually about six months after you install your solar panels and they're hooked up, you start getting these. Uh, paychecks every single month for about the next 15 years as they're paying you to generate electricity. And then there's a program called net meter, uh, which is also not in most states. So what this means is, okay, August, we have a lot more sun. Uh, the sun is up for many more hours than it is in January. So you might produce more electricity in the month of August than you actually use. So instead of losing that, 
it gets passed on to the next month. Well, September, we still get a lot of sun. So you once again, you might generate more electricity than you're used. Well, that gets added to the energy that you uh, saved up in August. And it keeps getting pushed down all the way into the winter when probably you're not producing as much electricity as you're using. And then it starts using those credits. Uh, that way you're not, you know, hopefully you're still not paying an electricity bill. That goes all the way up until April, which is actually perfect timing because that's when the days start to get longer. And if you have any excess still saved up, you lose it. However, you know, then it starts all over again and uh, they roll over, which is which is fantastic. Due to these three reasons, uh, Illinois is considered one of the best states in the entire union to get solar panels. Uh, that's why all the solar businesses are moving to Illinois. Um, that's why solar jobs are booming in Illinois. It's, it's a really great um, program. But maybe you live in a condo or your roof isn't good because you need to replace it soon or it's, uh, you have some shade on your home. So you're not a good candidate for putting solar panels on your own roof or whatever reason you decide you don't want it on your own roof, but you want to support it. Community solar is a fantastic program uh, where you get to support solar and save money. Uh, it's a little bit strange because you end up with two bills. You will see on your electric bill, hey, minus $50 from solar credits because you signed up for community solar. However, you will then get a bill from that solar provider for $40. Net savings, $10. Most people in Northern Illinois save about $10 to $20 when they sign up for community solar. Um, it's fantastic, extremely low risk, way to save money on your bills and support solar in Northern Illinois. I will say, uh, Income eligible get preference. If there's open spots for community solar, they get chosen first. Uh, my old man, my dad, he signed up a month and a half ago. He got put on the wait list. But ComEd just announced that they're going to double their community solar projects over 2023. So anyone who gets on this program wait list, uh, it should start moving very fast. Uh, so I recommend everyone who's not going to install solar panels on your roof, sign up for community solar. Um, real fast, there's a rooftop solar program uh, for income eligible where uh, the solar installer will lease solar panels on the homeowner's roof, uh, typically for free or for a very, very low uh, monthly fee. Uh, the lease is for 15 years. Anything goes wrong, uh, maintenance, uh, the installers on the hook to fix it, replace it, um, maintain it. And then after 15 years, they will offer a, a purchase offer to the homeowner, usually for a nominal fee of $1, in which case then the homeowner then owns the system. Uh, if they don't want to buy the system, the homeowner can ask them to remove the system or extend the lease um, for another five to 10 years. This is great because solar panels typically last about 25 years or longer, um, and it's a fantastic program. If they do buy it though, they will be on the hook for maintaining and removing it. So that's one of the considerations. Um, solar for all, we can go more in depth on it if anyone is interested. Uh, they also do it for nonprofits and municipality buildings. Uh, so it's it's not just for uh, residential homes. Real fast, uh, electric batteries. Uh, there's also a 30% tax credit if you wanna install a battery in your home. This slide, a lot of words. I just really wanted to emphasize that you can stack all of these incentives. You can get the tax credits. You can get the tax, uh, you can get the rebates. Uh, then you can go get any of the state um, incentives and the utility incentives. When you add all these things up, you can get immense savings while lowering your carbon footprint. Okay, I ran through that extremely fast, uh, trying to get us in on time and leave room for questions. And I see that there are some, but there are some. Yes, indeed. Um, we actually, we have a, a request uh, from Hillary uh, who wants to know if you will reach out to the Winnetka Library uh, to arrange a similar program. Um, and it sounds like you do this frequently, so. <laughs> yes, I have given this brief a few times, but I will be happy to reach out to Winnetka. Um, that, you know, thank you. And, you know, if you have uh, any contacts there, please encourage them to reach out to us as well. And we are recording this program tonight and the Evanston Public Library will put it up on our website. Uh, so uh, I will send out a message to everyone registered for this program 
uh, to let you know once that is ready and give you the link for viewing. So you can feel free, of course, then to share that uh, with anyone else that you think might benefit um, from learning more about this process. Um, I will let anyone else who has uh, any questions uh, type them either in the, the chat or the Q&A section, uh, but I have a question, um, and that is, uh, can you convert to an air source heat pump um, if you, for example, have like one of the older homes here in Evanston where you're using radiator heat, you know, so basically it's all hot water um, and have like a separate space pack uh, air conditioning system. So it's not sort of the, the same heat cool air force system that's uh, that's more current. Great question. Uh, simple answer, you absolutely can. Complicated answer, it may cost more uh, and it may not. <laughs> um, you know, some people use heat pumps just for one room. Maybe they're working from home and they don't want to heat and cool their entire house when they're just working in one room for the day. Uh, so some people will install a heat pump that just heats and cools that one room. Um, some people heat and cool their entire place through air source heat pumps. Um, and it, and you, you know, it absolutely works. Uh, the issue is older homes. Uh, air source heat pumps are not as efficient as geothermal, so it makes older homes more difficult. I was just hearing about um, a home that was built in the 1830s that just installed uh, geothermal heat pumps. Um, however, I'm working with a, a woman who installed air source, heat, air source heat pumps in her condo in Chicago, and she's having a lot of difficulty maintaining comfort and keeping costs down. The issue is she didn't insulate her home first. That is the critical first step for air source heat pumps is you have to uh, tighten up your home as much as possible in order to um, you know, help the system out. You, you, can, you can install a larger air source heat pump in order to make up for that that loss that increases the price. Um, the the that's why I always say home energy audit has to be the first step, followed by that insulation weatherization, uh, because then that allows you to right size your heat pump. Um, you may not need as as powerful of a system because heat stays in the uh, building longer, or you know heat stays out of the building longer during the uh, summer. Uh, and right sizing is really important for heat pumps because they do both the heating and the cooling. And if you um, have to generate so much heat for the winter, it may not be as effective in the summer. There's a, there's an Appendix J issue. Uh, well, there's an Appendix J out there, which for everyone here, all that means is it's a heat gain, heat loss calculation that's regulated that all of these people should be using. Your average HVAC company, though, oftentimes they just look at what you had last time and make a swap without even doing any math, which isn't great. Um, but if anyone is interested in, in installing an air source heat pump, please reach out to me. Uh, it's it's a great system. I just want to make sure that it happens the right way for you. And so I, I've developed you know a long list of questions that you should ask the contractors to make sure you're prepared for that. And we're working on a, an update on our um, better heat guide, which will provide all those questions for you. Um, but in the meantime. You know, reach out to me. Um, I think my email is on the next slide, maybe. Um, and uh, that way, um, you know, we could just talk it over and make sure that you're set up for success. Um, I'll type in my email here into the uh, chat box. All right. And then I know also, you mentioned um, we were speaking. I'm sorry, we were speaking earlier about uh, the fact that you're going to be updating the the guide that you have recent just recently put up because everything keeps changing um if people get on the mailing list for cub uh does that mean do you kind of automatically get that update or will, we, will that be pushed Absolutely. out um so i highly recommend that you join our mailing distro we're not obnoxious and if we are you can just unsubscribe real easily but what we do is all these guides you know we talked about how the rebates aren't in play yet you want to be the first one to know about it and you want it easily understood. If you join our, our distro, as soon as that is out, we'll update the guide, we'll push it back out. We have other guides. Uh, right now, NICOR and Comet are both asking for record rate hikes to be the largest in state history. Um, so, you know, we also, we also offer ways to help us fight them. You know, obviously we ask for donations, we're a nonprofit, I won't lie. But we also tell you, hey, you click on this button, you type in this comment, you hit enter, and the Illinois Commerce Commission will see that and that'll help uh, help our case. Or, hey, quick, easy 
you, you type in your address here, it'll show you who your state representatives are, call them, tell them that you're, uh, you think these rate hikes are insane and they should stop. That'll help us. Um, so it's multifaceted. We'll give you information. We'll help arm you. And um, you can see the current state of the energy world uh, and get nerdy with us on your own time. <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, give a, one more call for if anyone has a, a question um, or anything they need clarified, go ahead and type that in the chat. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much, David, for taking the time tonight to, to speak with us and uh, look forward to, to getting those updated guides and checking through all the, the cool resources that you mentioned tonight. Thank you so much. Last thing I'll say is we also offer different presentations. Uh, we have one on electric vehicles. We have uh, just on energy savings, a uh, whole different, well, a whole bunch of different things, uh, robocalls and cable issues across the gambit. So uh, we'd be happy to present again. Thank you for having us. And thank you everyone for listening. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we'll definitely uh, hope to have you back soon. <laughs>